Hey Westridge, I'm excited to have Travis Whitaker in the house. Travis is one of my favorite church planners for many, many reasons. He is from the Detroit area. He's a graduate of Liberty University. And Travis probably has the best hair of all of the church planners that we've ever worked with and certainly the best hair of anybody that's been on this stage. He and his wife Jen have four great kids. Back in 2015, they planted Mile City Church in South Lyon, Michigan. They've done a phenomenal job. Let me just give you a little fun fact about Travis. He and his family own one of the most popular cider mills in all of the Detroit area. People come from miles to hang out at this cider mill, which are big deals in Michigan. Hey, Westridge, would you welcome to the stage one of my favorite church planners, Travis Whitaker. Thank you. Was well, anyone excited to be at church today? Oh yeah, a place where we come to recharge, refuel, to get back out into our neighborhoods and workplaces and relationships to let people know about the hope that has radically changed our lives. For those of you watching online, just want to say welcome. We're so glad you're following along with us. If this is your first time checking out Westridge, we just want to say thank you for taking a risk to try something new. One of the things I always like to challenge people is to take the three-week challenge. Uh, it's hard to figure out a place like this if you just come once and come over the next three weeks. And we truly believe that if you make this part of your weekly rhythm, it, it has great value for you. And if you're not coming home for your entire family, can have the hope and power to change your life. So we're so glad uh, that you are joining us here today. I am so excited to be here at Westridge. It's so humbling to be able to, to speak here today with you all. Uh, I, I love your church. I love the leadership of your church, Pastor Brian and Kevin, uh, just the investment uh, that they have made on my life and the support that I feel. The model that you guys are in our nation to be a church planting open-handed church is just incredible. Uh, I, I, I'm so blessed. My, my, my family, one of your small groups, uh, has adopted us and, and they send, there they are, and, and they, they, you know, it's the cards and, and just, it's always, you know, Jen and I was talking, they always come with the perfect timing too, what God has a way of doing that, but we're just so grateful uh, for this church and the example it is. Uh, my wife and I planted Mile City Church uh, in 2015. We launched at Schoolcraft College right there, and from day one, we wanted to be like you, a church planting church, and so we launched with a church planter apprentice and launched him two years after, a uh, Grumlaw Church, that you also helped support, and some of your teams have gone and helped Grumlaw, and so, uh, and then four months ago, we launched another church out of us, uh, uh, another Mile City Lion location, and it's been an incredible journey, what God has done, and just to brag on what God is doing in just four months we've seen 27 people put their faith in Jesus which is just incredible and uh, uh, story after story I, I could go on and then uh, in our church planting pipeline we have three other church planters that we're raising up and our goal Lord willing is to plant them in the next 16 months and so it's just an incredible time uh, being a church planting church and we're so grateful again to have the leadership of your church uh, be our coaches and, and to learn from you. And my hope is that, you know, after, you know, when I think about, you know, 20 years of you guys church planting, my hope is that I can look as good as Pastor Brian and Amy look after 22 years. Here's a recent pic of them. Um, <laughs> that's what church planting can do to you, you know what I mean? Just, uh, isn't that face up incredible? Like, it's scary. And fun all at the same time. I can't, it just messes with your mind. I hope some of my pictures don't actually turn out the way that they do. But uh, uh, now, when I think about church planting, you guys have planted a lot of churches. And I kind of feel, not to say anything, but I kind of feel like I'm kind of like a favorite church plant around here. Because, as said previous, your pastor, I, I'm, I'm from where his heart is from. You know what I mean? And you guys probably get sick of hearing about the Michigan Wolverines and the Detroit Red Wings and the Pistons and the Tigers. And Brian, if you're watching, just know I'm, I'm not going to let you down. We're going to put some Detroit spirit in the room. Let's get the Tigers up on the screen just to just let, literally get it in your veins. And so just had to let you guys in on that a little bit. And, uh, but speaking of baseball, uh, I'm not really a big baseball fan. I'm more of a hockey fan being from the north. And I'm not really all that athletic at all. I'm more of a music guy. But my son, my nine-year-old, loves baseball. And because my son loves baseball, well, daddy's got to love baseball. And so you can see right here, you're looking at the assistant coach for the Little League Tampa Bay Race, okay? And uh, the coach learned very quickly 
uh, that he not only had to coach and teach the kids, but he had to coach and teach Coach Travis because he has no idea what he's doing out there, okay? So I became the bench coach, AKA babysitting from kids spitting seeds in each other's eyes, okay? <sighs> what a journey it was this season. We won some and we definitely lost some. And I will say, I'm okay with losing if the other team was better. But I'm not okay with losing when our kids are not teachable, when they're not, being, when they're not listening to our coaching, when you're, you're trying to coach them and they're out like flossing in the field or making sandcastles. You just want to scream. <clears throat> if you've ever coached Little League, you know what I mean. Or, or, uh, but it's not only the kids. Some of these parents need some uh, coaching too. From what they're doing in the stands and yelling out in the stands, it's just un. Believable, And so the idea that we're talking about today is how to be teachable people. Because in our nature, we don't like to be teachable sometimes, right? We want to do what we want to do. What, what's the common body language if you're not teachable? Come on, everyone do it with me. Actually, turn to your neighbor and look at them and say, I'm not budging. A little more soul this time. Just, give a, tell, just say it again. I'm not budging. Now the opposite body language would be everyone put your hands down like this and turn to your neighbor and say, I'm open. Tell them, I'm open. What would it look like for us to be a little more like this, open-armed, instead of being cross-armed, to be teachable, to be a little more open-armed than cross-armed as we navigate through our life? And it's not just being teachable with people, but it's being teachable to God. 2,000 years ago, God did something so amazing. He sent us his one and only son, Jesus. And because of Jesus, we have the power to accomplish so many amazing things. And 2,000 years ago, God sent his son, Jesus, to fix our sin problem. And this cross became so monumental. But what elevated this cross even more than the cross was an empty tomb that changed everything that we just sung about. And then after Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, but he talked about something that we have access to now, the gift of the cross, but we have another gift, another power tool, so to speak. And, and I, I want to read from you, uh, I, I read to you from John chapter 14, and here's another powerful gift that we now have. It says, Jesus said in John 14, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, the paraclete, to be with you forever. And this is the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. First John 4, 4 says, the spirit who lives in you is greater than the spirit who lives in the world. My friends, when we give our lives to Jesus, we are now given the power of the Holy Spirit that lives inside of you. And Jesus says, it's better, it's to your advantage that I go so that I can bring you the power of the Holy Spirit. But sometimes if you're like me, I think we forget that that. I think that we can forget and not grasp and become numb to the power of the Holy Spirit that we have inside of us. And sometimes maybe we feel like, well, I don't even know how to tap into that. And maybe you're here today and you're still exploring what it looks like to be a Jesus follower. And the idea of a spirit living inside of you kind of freaks you out. I'm so glad you're here because we're just going to navigate a little bit. Of what does it look like to be spirit led, to be more teachable people, to walk in his spirit? We got any dog lovers in the, house, in the fan in the house today? Okay. So uh, here's a picture of my family and my two little girls, Lena and London, they are begging daddy to get a dog. But as you can see, it's a zoo at our house right now. I mean, it's just crazy, but it's a beautiful time. It's a beautiful time, but man, it's to add another thing. We just, I don't know if we could handle a dog, but so anyways, we're not getting a dog. Um, so, <laughs> but I watch my neighbors walking their dogs. And if you ever, ever watch your neighbors walking your dogs, it's, it's kind of a fun thing sometimes because sometimes it's not them walking their dog, it's the dog walking them, you know what I mean? Paul reminds us in Acts chapter 20, he says that he was constrained by the Spirit, which in the original language is the idea to be literally bound to the Spirit. And it got me thinking as I was watching my neighbors walk their dog, that's in a similar way of being Spirit-led. Because when people walk their dog with the leash, the leash is to constrain the dog so that the dog will be on pace with its master. 
And then the same way as we're being spirit-led to be teachable people, it's the idea of we need to be in pace, to be in sync, in tune with the spirit. And sometimes God's getting way out ahead of us and we got to keep up. Or sometimes it feels like he's dragging. We're like, come on, God, where are you? But what does it look like for us to be a little more teachable to the spirit of the living God? Because of Jesus, we have the power of the spirit living inside of us. How do we go to be more open-armed instead of cross-armed when it comes to following after Jesus. And so today we're going to look at a historical event that actually took place where two guys were being led by the Spirit and they went from this to this. And my hope is as we see they had these questions that kind of triggered in their minds that allowed them to be more Spirit-led. And my hope is that we can grab onto those tools so that we could all be just a little more teachable. But before we dive in, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for me. Father, thank you so much for this time that we are here in this room. None of us are here by accident. We're all here for a reason. And help us not to miss it. Father, help us to be teachable. Help your words to just pop off the pages to us. Father, please be with me as I speak. Control my mind. Control my tongue. I pray this in the power of your son's name, Jesus. Amen. Amen. Well, hey, if you have a copy of the scriptures, please open it up to the book of Acts or turn it on if you will. Or if you don't have anything, don't worry, we got you covered. It'll be here on the screen. Acts chapter 8, verses 26 through 40, we're going to be looking at. And let me just kind of set this up. Jesus came, he died, he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he gave the great commission to go into all the world and share the gospel, helping that through planting of churches. And he told his closest friends that you were going to be my witnesses in Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. So at this time, the message and the power of the resurrection is just flying everywhere and people are just amazed by what happened through the power of the resurrection. And so they went into uh, Judea and, and it was happening and the gospel was expanding and that was working. And then they were into Samaria and that was happening and that was expanding. But now they're starting at this part in Acts, they're starting to go in parts uh, into the ends of the earth, into uncomfortable territory, uncharted waters where they've never been. And so this is where we pick up. You guys ready? You guys with me? Okay, here we go. Acts chapter 8, verse 26. And it says, Now an angel of the Lord said to Philip, one of Jesus' followers, Rise and go toward the south to the road that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is a desert place. And then it says, And he arose and went. Now look, it. if an angel speaks to you and tells you to go somewhere, odds are you're probably going to do it. But I wonder if there was a little bit of a question in Philip's mind when the angel told him to do this. I wonder if he was thinking a little bit like, wait, what? What? You want me to go where? Why don't you send Peter and John over there? You want me to go to the lowest point, to the last watering town? You want me to go to Gaza? I don't want to go to Gaza. Sometimes, you ever feel this way? Sometimes God's going to ask you to do something and you're going to be like, wait, what? I ain't doing that. I ain't going there. I'll never forget when God started to mess with my wife and I to plant Mile City Church. And literally, this was me. What? You got the wrong guy. You see, my story is I I used to just sing for Jesus all the time. That was what I used to uh, to do for my career. And I just wanted to sing for Jesus. I never wanted to do what I'm doing right now for you because I grew up with a stuttering problem. And I have to still to this day rearrange my sentences on the fly. And so I'm like, Moses is my man. You got the wrong guy. Send someone else. And so I'm cross-armed. I'm cross-armed. But as God always does, he just keeps messing with me. And I'll never forget the moment I was um, sitting in my parents. They have this little barbershop museum. Uh, uh, My great-grandfather was a barber before he planted a church in Detroit back in the 40s. And everyone that I, there's this church there, and everyone that I met that knew my papa would always say, you know what, your papa, he was the worst communicator you'd ever hear. (laughs) Thanks, thanks guys. Dry as dust, he'd just put you to sleep. (laughs) Thanks, appreciate that, yeah. But then they always would say, but he had a way with people and he taught his leaders how to love people and that's why his church was so successful and God did so many mighty things through that. And I'll never forget sitting there in that barber chair, cross-armed, and then slowly my arms becoming more open-handed and I felt the Spirit of God tell me, if I can use your papa, I can use you. 
Sometimes God's gonna tell you to do something and you're gonna feel like, what? What? Sometimes God's gonna ask you to do something for someone else and you're gonna be like, whoa, 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 wait, wait, what? Something, something to your spouse maybe, something to your parents, something to a friend. Sometimes God might tell you to do something and you're gonna be like, what? Maybe he might even ask you to forgive someone that you feel like doesn't deserve it. What would change for you if we were a little more teachable, a little more spirit-led and went from this to this when those questions of what would come to our mind? Let's keep going. Continues in Acts. It says, and there was an Ethiopian, a eunuch, a court official of Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all of her treasure. He had come to Jerusalem to worship and was returning. And seated in his chariot, he was reading the prophet Isaiah. And the spirit said to Philip, go over and join this chariot, which maybe have been another what moment. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet and asked this question. Do you understand what you're reading? And here's what the Ethiopian eunuch said. He said this, how can I? unless someone guides me. How can I, unless someone guides me? Which reminded me of, if you ever maybe are putting together a toy that the grandparents got, it's a little complicated, or maybe you you bought a piece of Ikea furniture that comes in a million pieces, and it's been hours of struggle, and you're trying to get this thing together, and you're questioning why you bought the thing in the first place, and then your lovely spouse walks into the room and says, do you understand what you're reading? And how do you respond? Do you respond like the Ethiopian eunuch? Do do you say, how can I, unless someone as beautiful and wise as you guides me? (laughs) Is Is that how you're responding? And then sometimes they'll literally pull the instructions from you and start pointing out where maybe you went wrong. And I'm supposed to be teachable? No! I just want to scream and have a few things to say. I mean, no, no, no. I'm like, uh. What would change if when the idea comes to our mind when we know we need to ask for help? Instead of being so prideful and mm, we just open up a little bit. What would change if we were willing to ask for help when we feel like we don't need help? What would change for you? What would change for me if we'd be more willing to be open-handed in those moments? Asking for help is not a sign of weakness. It is a sign of strength. And not just asking help from other people but going to the Spirit directly to ask for help. It's sad when I think about how many times I can so quickly go to Siri or Alexa or Google before I go to the Spirit. Maybe I'm the only one. But wow, we have, just please don't don't miss this. We have the power of the living God that can be our helper. He's our helper, he's our advocate. And not only has we communicated, but he's given us the gift of his word that is alive and it's living. And I like to say there's literally a pulse in these pages. Man, it is our guidebook. It is our helper. What would change when we feel like, oh, I don't want to ask for help if we go like from this to a little more open-handed. It continues. After he says this, Philip makes a great invitation. And check this out. This is so great. He says, and he invited Philip, the Ethiopian invited Philip to come up and sit with him. Now the passage of the scripture that he was reading was this. This was a prof- This was from the prophet Isaiah. He says this, like a sheep, he was led to the slaughter, speaking of Jesus. And like a lamb before its shears is silent, So he opens not his mouth. Jesus on the cross stayed in humbled silence. At any given point, he could have called out an army of angels, but he stayed silent for you and me. Amen. In his humiliation, justice was denied him. Who can describe the generation? For his life is taken away from the earth. 
And so the eunuch is there just trying to figure out, what does this mean? And so the eunuch said to Philip, about whom I ask does the prophet say this is? About himself or about someone else? And I love this part about being teachable, about being led by the Spirit. I love the line here where it says this, where it says that he invited Philip to come up and sit in his carriage. The Ethiopian eunuch gave permission for Philip to come inside his carriage. Come on up here and sit right next to me. Permission to speak into my life. And sometimes I think if we're honest, the idea of permission? Permission to get into my space? Uh Uh-uh. Especially if people have harmed us before. No, 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 no. That part of my life is off limits. Uh Uh-uh. Not just asking for help, but getting below the surface is such a key element in being led by the power of the Spirit. As said earlier, I, I've been a, a, a musician for years, and I love getting to write songs. And for the longest time early in my songwriting journey, that was my space. Not like my space, my space. Some of you know what I'm talking about, but I'm talking about this was my song. This was my art. This was, I don't want anyone coming around it. I don't want anyone touching it. I don't want anyone in on that process. It's kind of like this little sacred thing and kind of vulnerable and, and not till it's done can I then let everyone hear it or see it. But then some of my trusted friends said, hey, Travis, you should, you should let people into that process and just see what happens. And I was still like, I'm not letting anyone in. And then I finally uncrossed my arms and said, okay. And I began the journey of letting people speak into that process into my life. And when it first started, it was so uncomfortable for me and I did not like it. It felt so vulnerable. They would start to say things about the part of the song that I was like, what are you talking about? It felt painful. It felt hurtful. And then they want to go into a direction that maybe I didn't want it to go into. But as I went through that process and they would start to go in a direction and I would start to go in a direction and we kind of wrestle through the lyrics and the melodies as we began that process. Oh man. Then I started to get fruit of songs that I never thought I'd ever be able to be a part of and write and have impact with. My friends, I'm talking about a song. I'm talking about just a simple song. But what if we would allow ourselves to be more spirit-led, to allow people to get up into our carriage, to get up into the parts of our lives where we know we need help? And to uncross our arms. Some of your marriages are falling apart right now and you guys are the only ones that know. It's time to let people in and help walk you through that process. Some some of you with, with your health, you don't want anyone to know about your health and you need to go to the doctor for heaven's sakes and uncross your arms. I get it, I hate going to the doctor too. But it's time to uncross your arms and let someone speak into that area of your life. Some of you are just dealing with a habit or an addiction that only you know about. And you're walking alone in your crossed arm and you're thinking, I'm not letting anyone in there. And it's time to uncross your arms and let someone have permission. Because the stats are against you if you try to conquer this addiction on your own. What would change if we were more teachable people and allowed people permission to speak in two? our lives. Next, in Acts 8, chapter, or Acts chapter 8, verse 35, it says, Then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with this scripture, and he told them the good news of Jesus. And as they were going along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, See, here is water. What prevents me from being baptized? And he commanded the chariot to stop. And they both went down into the water. And Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came out of the water, check this out, the spirit of the Lord carried Philip away, and the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip found himself at Azotus, and he passed through. He preached the gospel to all the towns until he came to Caesarea. Ladies and gentlemen, the first teleportation in the first early church. Can you imagine that moment? Getting dunked and then all of a sudden the guy that dunks you just out of there. Why don't we have that technology yet? Can you imagine the technology of being able to teleport? You're stuck in Atlanta traffic. Not a problem. Teleport. 
You want to go to a Braves game? Psh, not a problem. Psh, teleport. You want to go to the Caribbean on some island? Grab your shades. Psh, teleport. This is kind of fun. You guys want to keep going? We just wherever you want to go, we'll go. We'll just go wherever you want to go. All right, sorry. Get back on track. Get back on track. Okay. So let, let's kind of land the plane here. Another question that is triggered, that arises up in this story that can help us be more spirit-led. But before we get there, it says this. It says, then Philip opened his mouth, beginning with the scriptures, and he told him the good news about Jesus. And if you could just go back in time and just picture yourself. Here's Philip next to the Ethiopian eunuch, and he tells them the good news of Jesus for the very first time. And maybe for some of you, this is all you need to hear today. That's why you're here today is because you need to hear this because maybe this is the first time that you'll hear this amazing truth. Philip says to the Ethiopian eunuch, he tells him the good news of Jesus. We don't exactly know what he said, but maybe it went something like this. Hey, I know you've been searching. I know you've been trying to figure out how to get right with God. You've been trying to do all these sacrifices and trying to do all these deeds to, to get it right, to get access to God. Well, guess what? The wait is over. God did it. All that we read about, all that they said, he came and his name is Jesus. And he took on the weight of the world on the cross. And then three days later, like he predicted, he rose from the dead. And because he rose from the dead, now we can have life. And the guessing game is over. And all of our sins, all of our guilt, all of our shame can be paid in full because of Jesus. And it just landed on the Ethiopian's ears for the first time. And then check out what happens. In that moment, it overwhelms him. And then they're just strolling, going down the road in the carriage, and they spot water. And he tells the driver, stop, stop everything. The spirit of God came over him and says, it's time to get dunked. It's time to go public with this faith. And he stopped. And what I love about that, that he commanded the chariot to stop. He had things to do. He had places to go. He was in charge of royalty of the treasure. They had a timeline, but it didn't matter. And sometimes there's going to be a question that triggers into our minds and we're going to hear the spirit of the living God say, stop. And when we're going to feel a little bit like this, we're going to be like, stop? You want me to stop now? You want me to rearrange my schedule? You want me to rearrange my values? You want me to rearrange my purpose? You want me to stop? And if we could just uncross our arms for a moment and be open in those moments and stop squelching the Spirit of God and start being led by the Spirit of God, look out. Look out. Some of you, the Spirit of God is telling you right now that you need to stop being in an unhealthy relationship right now. You know it's unhealthy. And it's time to be obedient and walk away. Some of you need to stop that habit or that thought life that is just destroying your mind. It's time to stop and be obedient to the power of the Holy Spirit. Some of you need to stop delaying a vision that God has given you, specifically you to go start something, to go do something. It's time to stop delaying and be obedient to the spirit of the living God. Some of you need to stop delaying being generous, being, in a, being generous in an area that God is telling you to be generous in. Some of you need to stop delaying serving here in this church or serving in the community specifically. It's time to stop squelching the spirit and be led by the spirit. For some of you, you've given your life to Jesus maybe this past week maybe this past month or year or 10 years, I don't know what your story is. You've given your life to him. But for some reason, you have been being disobedient by not going public with your faith through baptism. And you have all these excuses. Well, that's just between me and God. No one needs to know, or I don't want to get in front of people. Whatever the excuses are, it's time to stop. Your king died for you and rose for you and he asks us to go public with it. And so why wouldn't we listen to our king? And so today's the day for you to stop delaying and 
be obedient to the Spirit. And grab a connect card before you leave and say, okay, I'm gonna be obedient. I'm finally gonna go public with my faith. Westridge family, don't you wanna be more teachable? What would change if we would actually allow these questions that are triggered inside of our minds, the, the what question, the asking for help question, permission to speak into our lives, to stop squelching the spirit and being more obedient? What would change in your life? What would change in your relationships? What would change in your neighborhood? What would change if we would be more teachable people? It's because of Jesus that we have the power of the spirit living inside of us. Let me pray for us. With every head bowed and every eye closed, I want to speak to some of you in this room today that if you're honest, you've been cross-armed to Jesus. You've been pushing him off for years. You haven't been willing to surrender your life to him. You haven't been willing to make him king of your life. You haven't given him permission to speak into the carriage of your life. And today, if you're honest, you just say like, you know what, I'm done. I'm done playing the game. I'm done guessing it. I want to make Jesus the king of my life. I am going to rearrange and give my life to Jesus right now. No one's looking around. I'm not going to embarrass you or call you. But if that is you, if you just be so bold and say, today, Chess Travis, I want to put my faith in Jesus. I want to give my life to him. Would you just raise your hand so I can pray for you? Amen. Just say, that's me. Amen. Amen. I see your hand. Who else would just say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I'm done playing the game. The spirit is moving in me and I want to give my life to him. Amen. Okay, for those of you that put your hands up, you can put your hands down. And I just want to lead you into a real conversation with the king of the universe who loves you so much for who you are, not for what you do. He died for you. He rose again for you. And the scriptures say that if we confess with our mouth that he is Lord, that we will be saved. Saved from all of our sin, from all of the guilt, from all of the shame. It's erased once and for all. And so in the quietness of your heart, just... Just say this to him. Just say, Father, here I am. I'm uncrossing my arms. I'm opening up my life to you. Permission to speak into my life. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again for me. Forgive me of my sin. I want you, Jesus, to be the king of my life. As we continue to pray for those of you that truly meant that, you need to know this truth that the scriptures say that you will no longer perish, but you will have everlasting life. And that's life that starts right now. Oh, Father, we love you. We thank you so much for the gift of the cross and what it means. And because of Jesus and because of the cross, we thank you for the gift of the spirit. Oh, we want to be more teachable. We want to be more led by your spirit. And so, Father, forgive us when we're cross-armed. Help us to be more open and led and be in sync and in pace with you, our King. We love you in your son's name. Amen. Well, hey, can we just give it up for those who put their faith in Jesus for the first time today? Amen. Amen. But here's what we're going to do. The band's going to close us in a song and I'm gonna invite you to stand and as we stand and we sing this last song, let's uncross our arms and let's be open and not just be hearers of what we heard, but let's be doers of what we heard today.
No claim. 